had Marvel stuff happen um, in terms of the TV series. And I figured it's good enough time as any to talk about them. And by good enough time, I mean this May has is the gap between um, having two straight months of WandaVision and Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and then we're not getting Loki until next month. So now is a good time to talk about the two series we've gotten thus far. This because the sh this video will be coming out. Oh, several, like, several weeks after the final episode of Falcon and the Winter Soldier, and both Falcon and the Winter Soldier and WandaVision are streaming on Disney+. Plus. We, I figure, I feel okay, I feel okay about getting into some spoilers here. I'm not going to do, like, blow-by-blow -blow episode spoilers or anything like that, but... I am going to get into thematic spoilers and that sort of thing, and that's going to end up leading to the reveal of some twist stuff for both WandaVision and Falcon of the Winter Soldier. So I will, in the show notes below, have discussion, have um, the timestamps for when I'm talking about different shows. So if you just want to, if you just want to see the WandaVision stuff, which will be first. That'll have that, and then you can stop there. If you just want to see the Falcon and the Winter Soldier discussion, similarly, or y'all can just watch the whole thing. That's fine, too. You live your best life. The first off is WandaVision. And first thing to say, I'm going to say about this show, like both of these shows, honestly, before I get into spoiler stuff, both of these shows are shows which I am very much looking forward to getting the chance to own on Blu-ray for, if nothing else, the audio commentaries for episodes and that sort of thing. WandaVision, because there is a level of knowledge about sitcoms, about old sitcoms that, and the evolution of the medium that was put into that episode, in that show, and I am, I, I, there have got to be deep cuts that just slipped past me. There's like there's got to be like a chunk where it's like oh this is by the way access actually a reference to this to this episode of I Love Lucy that's not the one that that's not the one one of the ones that everyone talks about it's it's not the factory one or the commercial one with the vitamin D vegemin or or whatever and this is our reference to that or alternatively uh, like actually the bit with the there's a bit, not getting too much into spoilers here, there's a bit with, like, the second episode of the show, which almost feels like they're vit like, like them doing their shout-out to Vitamita Vegemin um, from I Love Lucy, which is probably one of my favorite bits, more than the... Um, more than the, 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 the assembly line, the, the chocolate's assembly line. Um, I, I, I kind of did, like, that, anyway. So, but aside that, like, with the audio commentaries for these, both in, with the uh, history of sitcom shoutouts on uh, WandaVision, and then Falcon and the Winter Soldier is, like, both of these shows run into production difficulties related to co related to the human malware. And I think... That Falcon and the Winter Soldier, in terms of presentation, ran into more problems with it. I think ultimately, or it's definitely more of a case where it feels like what they wanted to do in multiple respects was hindered by COVID by you know I'm not monetized by COVID nineteen. Uh, whereas WandaVision because of the sitcom framework, it didn't quite hit it that much. Hit it that much, because you don't, like... Sitcoms don't have big masked crowd scenes very often. That sort of thing. So, that wasn't as much of a hindrance there, I think. Ultimately, both shows are very... like Before I get into spoilers and the two chunk seg segments, both shows are very strong outings. And, but they also do definitely have, feel like they have flaws in the context of, of 
Marvel very much exper like re-experimenting with doing television series, this time with more involvement by, for lack of a better term, the principals, the actual Avengers. You, like, the most we got for Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was, outside from Coulson, is we got a couple guest appearances by uh, Sif, and a couple guest appearances by Maria Hill and Nick Fury. Those were nice, but, like, that was kind of it. There was, like, there was never... We never got that moment of, like, for example, with Coulson still being alive, of like, oh, Tony Stark or, like, or, um, Steve Rogers finding out that Phil Coulson is, in fact, still alive. Particularly with, like, you know, Maria Hill being involved with, um, basically being aide de camp, for lack of a better term, to the Avengers, or, like, in charge of organizing their um, logistics or that sort of thing, or with Nick Fury after appearing de after faking his death, um, showing up and the, in during the events of um, Age of Ultron, we never really got that moment of, oh, Bill Coulson's alive, and these people who, these main Avengers who have a personal connection with Phil Coulson um, through various films or that sort of thing, find out that this guy's alive and seek him out to talk to him. And I understand why they didn't do that, for starters. It, afford, affording Chris Evans, Chris Hemsworth, or... <laughs> oh, God. Basically, getting Iron Man, Captain America, Thor... Um, any of the act of the big Avengers on the show would probably win a big ass cost rise. Robert Downey Jr. especially um, would probably been a big ask cost wise. Um, so I could I understand why they didn't do that from a logistical standpoint, but this from a narrative standpoint, it felt like something that they could have done or, or that should have done. Um, that's something that you got to touch on, and it's not something that fits into a movie necessarily. So, consequently, the series, by involving the principal of it, it feels like it's it's giving the opportunity for these for these characters to get their own subsidiary stories outside of films, and that's a big deal. Okay, well. Less so subsidiary for Falcon and the Winter Soldier with it, it's it's already out. It's on. It it was on Colbert, so it, it's less of a spoiler here. With Falcon officially taking on the moniker of Captain America at the end of that uh, at, at the final episode of that show, like it's less the uh, subsidiary players, but still, it's. Doing side stories with these principal adventures in a longer form format is a bigger deal and changes the storytelling that you're doing and it changes the pacing of the stories and lets you do different kinds of stories, more personal stories, more do more character development stuff. The things that, with these characters, they could potentially really drag down a movie not saying I don't want character development in my movies, quite the contrary, but it, like if you want to spend a significant amount of time with Sam Wilson's family, with um, Bucky's efforts to atone for his actions as the Winter Soldier, unless you're doing a movie with as a focus on that, you have less of an op you have less opportunities to fit that into a film narrative. Again, unless those things are particularly the focus, they can have capsule, capsule scenes and developments and that sort of thing, but otherwise less so. Similarly, you can't do as much, like, like the family stuff we got with, like, Hawkeye in Age of Ultron, um, and a little bit in Civil War, like, not a lot. If you want to have more development of that family dynamic and flesh out those characters as characters 
you need to give that time. And there's less time to do that in a movie, particularly a big ensemble piece. So when all said and done, I think this experiment, like it, it, it's, a, it's a good one, but there's still places where they're definitely had experience in growing pains. And I will get to that in the spoiler section. But long story short, these are absolutely worth watching. And they are both very strong so shows in their own respect. And they're both shows which have things to say, which they say with varying degrees of respect on the big things, but on the personal, on the personal things, they generally nail it. With that, we now get into the spoiler section, and we will start off with WandaVision. So, the different Avengers and MCU films generally fit into, like, I'm not going to say frameworks, but are, like, in terms of the types of stories they tell, they do, like, they are somewhat consistent in telling different types of stories with these characters. For example, um, Thor films tend to be big dramatic epics um, in fitting with the fact that you're dealing with a god who is known for, who, whose legends are described as sagas. In fact, they're from whence the term saga came um, to an extent. And so there, there is a weight and scope with the, with the Thor stories. And it's also, this is, played into further by the comic stories with that character you the finding runs of the thor of thor comics is our stuff like walter simonson's thor run which has um him like this big epic battle against surter and storming um helheim with um with Scourge the Executioner covering their retreat at the Bridge of Galibru and all that stuff. So it's, it's, so that's what you get out of Thor. With Iron Man, and this is where we're going to get into the particular focus for WandaVision, actually. Iron Man stories are Tony Stark's demons. Tony Stark's personal demons. It's Iron Man 1 is Tony Stark after his experience um, getting taken hostage and breaking out of his, uh, his incarceration and becoming Iron Man, contending with the legacy that he has left on the world through, the, through, his, through his family business of making weapons and... Just basically deciding, ah, uh, this is, this is not who I want to be, and this is not the, this is this is not who I want to present myself as. I am a better person than this. On Iron Man Two, it's Tony Stark being poisoned by his uh, arc reactor and going. I need to make sure that what I'm doing, what the, what the, what I want to do, endures after me. And in the process, basically coming up with silly convoluted ways to move control of Stark Industries over to Pepper because he trusts her to continue with what he's trying to do. Getting a suit of the Iron Man armor on um, Rhodey because he trusts Rhodey for Iron Man's mission. Uh, that sort of thing. And then ultimately dealing with the engineer and, and all these end up in some manner engineering his way out of the problem that he, that he has finds himself in uh, oh, Iron Man three. Also Tony dealing with his post-traumatic post-traumatic stress disorder after the events of the Avengers. In all these cases, again, it's Tony engineering his way out of a problem. When then Tony shows up in other works, it is Tony engineering his way to create a problem and then trying to engineer his way out of whatever he did with varying degrees of success, if not actual failure, in the case of Civil War. So, Wanda, oh, so going forward, we did there, this, this spot is open. This spot and the Steve Rogers spot on this of 
the big political action thriller thing, which I will get to in a minute when I talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier, are open. Um, Tony Stark has died in universe, and Steve Rogers has retired. So, where who gets the really big personal stories? And the answer for that, at least in the context when we get from WandaVision, is Wanda Maximoff, at least for the moment, is the one getting the big narrative, character-focused stories where it is a character trying to address their demons, their personal demons, not metaphorical, um, are they, are actually metaphorical, not literal demons, um, trying to deal with their, their a personal trauma, personal stressor, that sort of thing. Creating another problem and then using their powers, then the way that their powers involve or interact to get out of it. But not necessarily, but being in a positive space afterwards, or at least a better place. When, when all, the, all three Iron Man movies, when Tony comes out of those films, he is, like, I mean, Tony Stark is also important to distinguish him and Wanda Maximoff. Tony Stark, rich, as he has introduced himself in uh, in the Avengers, billionaire playboy philanthropist, also white guy. Um, oh, billionaire playboy philanthropist guy. Um, Wanda Maximoff, um, immigrant with intrinsic superpowers and not financially well off. I mean, she's got some money. Undoubtedly, the um, Avengers initiative stuff that Tony set up was paying her a stipend. Um, maybe even they had a trust fund and um, retirement funds and that sort of thing set up in their names um, by Pepper or that sort of thing. But when um, she's, she doesn't have the degree of of political or financial power and, or privilege that Tony Stark had. So when it comes up in the course of this story that this whole situation of this town in New Jersey that is getting trapped, that is seemingly trapped inside a series of sitcoms that are slowly moving forward in time stylistically, um, starting from the 1950s, going to the 60s, 70s, 80s, and onwards, you have a very different sense um, as far as for the outcome of this, that if Tony accidentally trapped a town of people in a holodeck modeled after 1950s, not modeled after sitcoms progressing forward in time, he, like, I'm not going to say that if, if that was the plot of Iron Man 4, it would, it would end with, oh, that's our Tony! <laughs> Which would certainly play to the sitcom thing, but it would, but there is, but there would, there would be repercussions but it wouldn't feel as heavy necessarily as with Wanda Maximoff, where more or less by accident, which is, that's the twist, is she's been, she unleashes this tremendous amount of magical power without intending to do so to create this new, this pocket reality. I, I'm almost tempted to do the, um, Grab the fate stay night term, the Nasuverse term, and call it a reality marble. Um, oh, I'm gonna call. I'm, I'm gonna do that. She create uh, her creating this reality marble, and basically using that to cope with her grief. Like, like there's this just building pile of grief that she's never really had a chance to like really cope with and handle from the death of her parents, death of her brother, and the death of Vision, especially the, the death of Vision, because remember, the turnaround time for that, because this, this is 
started not too long after the blip, or as far as this show, where it starts, where the blip being when everyone comes back. Um, after Hulk snaps his fingers in uh, Avengers Endgame, that we went. Wanda is forced to kill Vision. Thanos undoes it. Then he kills Vision, takes the Infinity Stone, and then has enough stones to do the snap, during which time Wanda dusts, is dusted, as opposed to being forced to stick around for those five years. So, then the blip happens, Wanda comes back, presumably in Wakanda, she gets a chance to just lay into Thanos for a bit, and then the fight's over. And we see kind of what happens after afterwards with her going for going to Vision's body and going to this property that she that the Vision had bought in up in New Jersey, upstate New Jersey with the intent of building a home there in the future. Only it's currently a vacant, just, just a vacant lot now, but she doesn't know that. Goes there, finds a vacant lot, and then just all the grief from all of this just, boom, comes down on her. And just, and that's what leads to her just letting out this grief and frustration and all of that is what for causes the formation of this reality marble and ultimately the circuit the the leads to the chain of events for the rest of the series and consequently this 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 makes for three really great things about this show first this is like i can't see any of the like as much as much time as Iron Man 3 put into Tony Stark coping with his PTSD, this, this, this film, or the show, I should say, this show puts way more focus and gives much more, of a time, much more time into, well, Wanda Maximoff trying to deal with her grief, trying to cope with that through the framework of sitcoms of these one and done stories that we the comedy stories where everything generally just wraps up together at the end of the car and the any repercussions that carry over to future episodes are relatively minor that sort of thing and and it gives much more time to let the to let it show the audience that she that this is what is happening that this is her going through the grieving process particularly once we realize that oh wanda's at least somewhat in control not maybe not completely but partially in control over the course of the show and like i think that other marvel films would try that the marvel directors will like or, 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 would want to try that like that's a big part of like the Guardians of the Galaxy movies is also is getting into this material like with family dynamics and found family versus birth family and all this that and the stuff in between. But there's always the uh, there's always we have to have a larger threat that has to be fought. That is bigger than our personal issues. It's so we have to work through this to get to the thing that lets us do the fight. It's the Mandarin in Iron Man 3. It's Ego the Living Planet in Guardians of the Galaxy 2. It's that sort of thing. And here. It, and it's not that as much. It's, there's like, we have a supers fight. We have a point in 
in the movie's screenplay or the show screenplay. I want to call it a movie because it's a got movie budget. Uh, there's a there's definitely a point in the movie screenplay, or I should say, the movie the the TV show story outline, where they're plotting down what happens in what episode and that sort of thing. There's a plot in the episode where they go, okay, and this is and they has fight. This is our they has fight moment. We because we we need to have a they has fight. So this and we have that in the last episode of this with the version of the vision that Wanda has created using her magic versus the sort of reconstituted, reprogrammed, but not with the soul in him version of the vision that Sword has, that the shady, crooked director of Sword has created, and then Wanda versus um, Agatha, um, Agatha Harkness. You have that. And... That, that that's our okay. We have to have a supers fight in here, but even then, the scope of it is we're not fighting over, we're not fighting to save the world, we're not fighting to save the galaxy, we're not fighting to save a planet, we're not fighting even, we're not even fighting, um, over saving over like stopping a heist, like you're fighting over a small suburban town with a pop with that. Back when Prairie Home Companion was a thing, would have been like the town in New Jersey that actually qualifies for Talent from Towns under 2000 for those episodes of the show. But, like, that's it. And, when all said and done, like, as far as for, for the scope of the story, it's this part of it works really well. I like, like, it's, it's a very personal story. And using the framework of a sitcom lets them do very interesting things with it. There's also the underlying level of sort of suburban horror beneath mundanity kind of thing, with the, with, which what is described as David Lynchian. And I definitely agree that that is there as well. And it is also, it is also very enjoyable and interesting and helps hook the audience in. Um, but as far as tonally, it's a much more personal story there. On the other side of it, we get we get bits with three supporting characters from other Marvel films who are getting to in, who normally would not interact. Would normally be never the never the brain thrice never the thrice shall meet. Um, I guess is the right term with um. Darcy Lewis with Monica Rambeau, formerly who we last saw in Captain Marvel as a precocious teenager and is now an adult. And I'm, I, I want to call him Jimmy Woo, but I don't think that's the right name. Um, That is, all right, maybe that's Ant-Man 2 is where he shows up. I think it's the first one. Okay, that is... Yeah, Jimmy Woo. Okay, I had it right the first time. I was right, Jimmy Woo. Oh, I, I I was worried I'd gotten the name wrong. So, I will edit the bit out. So, you have... You have Jimmy Woo. You have... No character is falling completely out of my head. Blah. Alright, so we have Jimmy Woo. We have Monica Rambeau. We have... Um, Why am I spacing this character? I feel really bad about that. I 
I just preserved him a few minutes ago. Darcy Lewis. There we go. I... Hopefully they can say the sentence again with all three character names and not space them. So, we have uh, Darcy Lewis, we have Jimmy Woo, we have Monica Rambeau, now an adult, and we have these three characters who we normally would not get to see interact with each other because they'd be in their respective films. Darcy's in the Thor movies, Jimmy Woo's in the Ant-Man movies, and presumably Monica would be in the Captain Marvel film. But we get the three of these characters getting to interact with each other and having them play a major role in the film's sub in the film's B plot, and with Monica not only having a significant role in the film's climax, but also with her getting a superpower origin story, basically meaning that she, well, on one hand, this means they don't have to spend as much time on her getting her powers in the next Captain Marvel movie, or at least using them. Uh, you have this as a basis for further developing her powers in the next film. But on the other hand as well, you have these three characters who are familiar with the weirdness of the Marvel Universe in varying extents, but who are also, for lack of a better term, um, outsiders to the inner life of Wanda and the Vision. They, like, they've encountered the stuff that Ant-Man like, Ant deals with and that um, with the weirdness in, involving the Asgardians and the other cosmic shenanigans with Captain Marvel, but they're still... Like, this is something they're not too familiar with, and it works. It gives... It puts them in the same position to a certain extent as a significant chunk of the audience. Um, and that definitely benefits the film. It also lets them get into some other it else, other issues with less so the snap because we only or there I say the blip because while we see the blip from Monica's perspective, we only see kind of snippets from the blip because it's relatively recent. So they, they kind of save that for Falcon and the Winter Soldier, which bit. This is quite my longer videos in a in a while, but that's okay. And that bit works well. It's it's an it's not as he much of a nar heavy narrative thrust to the series. It is opportunity for the audience for these characters to kind of give the audience a little bit of guidance in terms of figuring some stuff out in terms of the main themes of the story. And I think the other part of this is they provide a perspective on the other part of this is there's no kind of bones about it. What Wanda is doing, even if it, what Wanda is doing is lashing out in grief. It, she is impulsively just lashing out. It, it is the superpowered equivalent of screaming and flailing because you because someone important to you has died and you just can't anymore. It is lashing out in grief and despair. And when people do that, sometimes they hurt other people. And in this case, with 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 well. Scarlet Witch, she ends up hurting a lot of people. Like, people in town generally don't get hurt, hurt in terms of killed or anything like that, but it, she inflicts, she, she does something that are traumatic for them. And I think that the, that the show, I keep wanting to call it a film, the show does a Good job. Does not a good, not quite good, but a okay job of kind of exploring that as well. On the one hand, once this come out, we as the audience are sympathetic for her, or for Wanda, but we 
don't cut her, but the show does not cut her slack. We like once she starts releasing her grip on the town, the people of the town are justifiably pissed. Like as they like as they say on their computer, we saw your nightmares. We saw your nightmares about your brother's death, about the battle in Wakanda and uh, Vision's death. We, on the one hand, we know your trauma, but also we're constantly experiencing your trauma. Never mind our being stuck in routines and patterns that are enforced by you and those of us who are at the fringes of the community and the fringes of your set are locked in root like very minor routines because you're mad you don't quite have the magic to maintain a daily cycle of life for all of us and we're real people and we're not characters in a video game and that i think works it really get it I, I like how it conveys the idea that people who are experiencing pain people experiencing trauma experience pain and like like they can hurt other people in their pain and trauma and it's important to understand that but we do not have to forgive them we necessarily um or like it, it's the thing that happens we it is important to be aware of this and that this can be this is the cause of the trauma but we but it explains it, it does not excuse it, is I guess the way I would put it. And that part I think is very important, very useful in its depiction as well. Um, particularly when so often works of fiction will depict characters engaging in abusive behaviors due to trauma, due to stress, due to fear, and then later use that later on in the work to write it off as okay. Even Iron Man in particular did this. Some of Tony Stark's behavior. The Iron Man films, some of Tony Stark's behavior. So I'm interested to see what they, how, how this goes forward with Wanda Maximoff. In the sense that will this character narratively be serving the role of these are the stories about a character's dealing with their personal demons and with their inner lives and that sort of thing. But in the process... Um, using like get, creating problems and trying to use their powers to address them with varying degrees of success and facing repercussions because of it. So that's where we're at with there. And in a moment, I will deal. We'll talk about Falcon and the Winter Soldier. <laughs> 